this question of uh, the theory of permanent revolution might seem to many people as an old uh, polemic that took place about 100 years uh, ago in relation to uh, the strategy for the Russian uh, Revolution, the strategy of the Marxists in the Russian Revolution, but in fact uh, is one that is not only limited to that particular period and that particular country, but that has uh, worldwide implications and that I will say is uh, still very relevant for today uh, in, a, in, in regards to the strategy uh, for revolution in backward countries, countries of late capitalist uh, development, of which there are still uh, quite, quite a lot. This uh, theory of permanent revolution was first formulated by Leon Trotsky in 1904-1906, in, uh, and was summarized <coughs> in a book called uh, uh, Results and uh, Prospects, which uh, Well Read has published together with the Permanent Revolution in this uh, edition, which I'm guessing is available from the bookshop over there. Um, and at that time, uh, Trotsky, before, during and after the 1905 revolution, in which he played an important uh, role, a very important uh, role, try to summarize his main conclusions as for the strategy of the Marxists, the strategy of the proletariat in the revolution in uh, Russia. Uh, and as I say later on, this uh, was shown to have implications, more general implications in other countries, which were in one way or another similar to Russia. Uh, at that time, Russia was a very backward uh, country, dominated by the peasantry, uh, with a dictatorship, very, very semi-feudal uh, class relations in the, in the countryside, dominated by big landowners, small peasants, and a lot of landless uh, peasants. Uh, but at the same time, the country had had uh, what Trotsky described as, a, as an uneven and combined uh, development. There, were, there, were, there was this sea of backwardness in the countryside, but there were pockets of uh, capitalist industrial development in the main uh, cities and in the west of the, of the country. So this was a country where the classical tasks of the bourgeois democratic revolution had not been uh, completely carried out, in many cases not carried out at all, i.e. the task of uh, national uh, liberation, the task of, uh, above all, the agrarian uh, reform had not been uh, carried out, but at the same time was <coughs> a country where there were pockets of capitalist development, and this capitalist development was also uh, was the grafting of the latest and most development technique of capitalism in the advanced capitalist countries onto this sea of uh, backwardness. So you, you, you didn't have a normal development of capitalism in, uh, in uh, Russia, as it had uh, taken place in other more advanced capitalist countries, but it was a combination of different stages of development in the same uh, country. And this, and this provoked a number of <coughs> debates in, uh, in uh, Russia about the strategy of the, of the Marxists. First of all, <coughs> there were... <clears throat> two main trends, two main points of view within uh, vi po points of view within Russian social democracy, uh, that of the Mensheviks and that of the Bolsheviks. Both trends agreed on one question, and that is that the main tasks of the revolution in uh, Russia were the tasks of the bourgeois democratic revolution, the establishment of a democratic republic and the agrarian reform uh, above all. Uh, they never uh, co contemplated the idea that the task in a backward country like uh, Russia was to fight for socialism and workers' uh, power. So the main difference between these two trends uh, was as to which class was to lead the revolution and the role that different classes were going to play in that particular revolution, which they all agreed its character was bourgeois democratic uh, revolution. <coughs> the Mensheviks, i.e. the reformist or right-wing uh, uh, element within the Russian social democ democracy, which is the, the way Marxists called themselves at that time, social uh, democrats, they, they argued that because 
the tasks of the revolution, which chiefly the tasks of the bourgeois democratic revolution, that the bourgeois had to lead the revolution, and that the working class, which the, it was the party that they uh, represented, the party of the, of the workers, had to play the role of being the extreme left wing, the left wing of that uh, movement, but always subordinate to the bourgeois liberals, and for the bourgeois liberals was the task to lead that revolution and to take power after the overthrow of the, of the old uh, regime. That was more or less the position that the Bolsheviks uh, held, which obviously had uh, lots of implications in their practical uh, work, in their approach to the bourgeois liberals, which were, they had different uh, groupings and organizations at that time. They were very active in, active in petitioning the king, petitioning for a Duma, and uh, for, for a democratic parliament, and, and so on. The Bolsheviks had a different point of view. They, they agreed the main tasks of the revolution were bourgeois democratic uh, re uh, tasks, but they uh, didn't think that the bourgeois liberals were capable of leading such a uh, revolution. And uh, they developed this uh, idea also on the basis of their own practice. The bourgeois liberals were coward. They uh, wanted the uh, democratic republic, but they were too afraid to mobilize the masses. The main uh, form of agitation was petitions, uh, banquets, uh, asking politely from the old uh, regime to concede uh, democratic reforms and so on. And it was in the, uh, in the class character of the leadership and, 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 and the weakness of this social class in uh, Russia. Furthermore, uh, as a matter of fact, the capitalist class in uh, Russia, in as much as it existed, was a weak capitalist class and had many ties, uh, economic, family, personal ties, with the landowners. Uh, so from that point of view, it was very difficult for them to be consistent in carrying out one of the main tasks of the bourgeois democratic revolution, which was the agrarian uh, reform, the agrarian revolution, the distribution of the land to the peasants in order to create a, a class of uh, small capitalist uh, owners in the, in the countryside and, and a national market for the products of the, of the bourgeoisie. They were, they were therefore cowardly, very meek in their demands, and the Bolsheviks stressed this point. They said, look, the only class that can really push for a genuine uh, agrarian reform is the, is the class of the poor peasants. I, this is a, a petty bourgeois class, but it's completely different from the, the bourgeois have links with the landowners, the, the, the small uh, peasants. They have an interest in this uh, revolution. And they said, therefore, the proletariat in uh, workers in the cities must forge a close alliance with the poor peasants, particularly the poorest sections of the peasants. This is the only way that we can push forward uh, the revolution and carry out uh, a sweeping agrarian uh, revolution and establish a democratic uh, republic. And they said, therefore, that uh, this was Lenin's position, that a close alliance between the workers and peasants was the only way to carry out the revolution in, uh, in Russia. That there should be no trust should be put on the bourgeois liberals who were already afraid of uh, revolution. There is another element here that uh, since, as I explained before, uh, Russia was a, a country of late capitalist uh, development, had arrived late to the, to the scene of uh, history from the point of view of the development of capitalism, at the same time that the bourgeois was supposed to be fighting uh, the tasks of the bourgeois democratic revolution against the old uh, regime, the landowners, the Tsar, and, and so on, a, a powerful working class had already emerged in the cities. Uh, and this, this powerful working class, if mobilized, uh, will become a threat to the interests of the capitalist uh, class. They didn't want to fully mobilize the <coughs> working class. This is a, a factor that had already been present in earlier bourgeois <coughs> revolutions, even, even in the classic uh, bourgeois revolution of France in 1789, you can see how, in reality, it's not, it's not the bourgeois that is the motor force of that revolution, it's the, the plebeian <coughs> masses of Paris, the artisans, the sans culottes and so on, that provide the most radical battering ram against the old uh, regime. 
uh, under the leadership of the bourgeois. The bourgeois are the ones who, who provide the ideas, who finally benefit from that uh, revolution, but at the same time they are also afraid. And it comes a point where the plebeian masses of Paris are going further and further to the left. At one point they impose the, the, the law of the maximum, the law of the maximum in, in prices, and so on, and they, they establish, they, they start to push for some measures that are already, in a very embryonic form, anti-capitalist measures. And it is at this point that the big bourgeois intervenes and says this has gone far enough and tries to push the pendulum back, although never as back as restoring the old uh, feudal uh, regime. But already in that classical bourgeois revolution you can see the contradiction between the plebeian masses, that are the ones who are fighting the revolution in practice, and the bourgeois, who are afraid of the popular mobilization of the masses, will go further than what they, what they want. But obviously, in uh, Paris in 1789, uh, there wasn't a working class like there was in Petrograd in 1917. The, the, the situation is qualitatively different. But already in 1848, for instance, in, in, the, in the bourgeois revolutions of 1848, you can already see how, for instance, Marx and Engels criticize uh, the cowardness of the bourgeois in carrying out their own uh, uh, revolution. In, and in that respect, they, they, they are the, actually the first ones to use the phrase perma of permanent uh, uh, revolution. But in Russia in 1917, the situation was qualitatively different, i.e. The, the bourgeois were very afraid of the independent mobilization of the working class, even though the working class Parties had set themselves as the task, the, the main task, the bourgeois democratic uh, uh, revolution. The, the, the capitalists had, uh, as I said before, all sorts of links and ties with the old uh, regime, with the landowners, with the, with the monarchy, and, and so on. And, uh, and this was uh, the reason why Lenin formulated uh, the idea uh, of a democratic dictatorship of the proletariat and the peasantry. I, this, this was uh, going to be a dictatorship, but not a dictatorship of the workers, not a government of the workers, but a government of the workers in alliance with the peasants. Uh, he, he was the, the way in which he attempted to formulate what class forces had to lead that uh, revolution, i.e. the poor peasants, the workers could not do this without an alliance with the poor peasants. And it was not clear at this time whether the peasantry could play an independent role in this revolution or not. This was one of the matters for uh, discussion, the matters that was much disputed, and it was only resolved in 1917 in the practical experience of the Russian Revolution. There was at that time, uh, 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 and there, there were a number of peasant uh, parties, but the main one was, was the SR party, the, the Social Revolutionary Party, drew its strength mainly from the peasant uh, masses. Uh, and it was not clear to Lenin at this point what would be the relationship within, in this government, uh, this dictatorship, between the workers and the peasants, the, the relative uh, specific way that each one of these two class, class forces would play in that, uh, in that alliance. And, uh, but it was clear to Lenin that this was not going to be a bourgeois republic, a bourgeois democratic republic. It was something else. It was not led by the, by the bourgeois. The bourgeois liberals could not uh, consistently carry out this revolution and come to power. It had to be the workers in alliance with the peasants. Trotsky explains that this formula had an algebraic uh, character because the, 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 the relative uh, role of the two different classes was not at that point yet uh, clear. But there was a third position within Russian social democracy and that was the position that uh, Trotsky formulated in <coughs> 1904 that he developed during the 1905 revolution, and he finally put in writing in, in results in, uh, and prospects. Uh, incidentally, just, I just forgot that uh, Lenin's position had another part to it. I, in Russia, the tasks are bourgeois democratic. They can only be carried out by the workers and the peasants, not by the bourgeois liberals. But he then added this uh, revolution in Russia will then be supplemented by revolution in Europe, where conditions for a socialist revolution do exist because of the development of capitalism, 
because of the, the strength of the working class, the development of technique and science and technology and uh, capitalism, the development of the productive forces is much more advanced. And then the European workers moving over to a socialist revolution will then connect again with the Russian revolution and help us move in, that, uh, in the direction of uh, <coughs> socialism. So uh, Lenin also had an internationalist perspective to his uh, uh, approach to the strategy for, for the revolution. But he didn't think the socialist revolution was uh, possible or was posed in Russia at that time uh, only when the, the, the European workers, as a result of the spark of the Russian Revolution, will move towards socialism, then socialism will be possible in uh, Russia on the basis of that. The position of Trotsky was also very uh, close to the position of the Bolsheviks, in as much as he also uh, 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 thought, obviously, that the, the bourgeois liberals could not play a leading role in this uh, revolution. But he developed uh, this uh, position a bit further. And he argued clearly that the peasantry could not play an independent role in, uh, in the revolution. He argued that the, the peasantry is a very uh, heterogeneous class. It's uh, upper layers, i.e. the richer peasants who, in some instances, employ uh, labor of other peasants and so on. They have big extensions of land and so on. They tend, the upper uh, layers of the peasantry, they tend to come closer to the ruling class in the cities, the bourgeoisie. Uh, while the lower layers, i.e. the poor peasants or the landless uh, peasants, come, tend to come closer, the class interest identify themselves, they identify them with a class in the city, which is the, the, the proletariat, the, the, the working uh, class. The, also because of the very individualistic approach, i.e. the peasant wants the land for himself, he wants the division of the land. Uh, he doesn't have a collective uh, approach instinctively. Uh, the, therefore, the, 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 the peasantry could not play an independent uh, role and had to seek support, lean on one or another of the main classes in a capitalist society in the cities, i.e. the bourgeois or the, or the, or the workers. And the, therefore, the, the bourgeois democratic revolution, the tasks of the bourgeois democratic revolution could only be carried out by a dictatorship of the proletariat, a dictatorship of the workers with the support of the poor peasants. So this is, this is already kind of resolving the algebraic uh, nature of Lenin's uh, formulation. He doesn't say this is an alliance of equals. He says that the working class might, must play the leading role uh, with the support of the poor layers of the peasantry. And he then said another thing. He also argued that once the workers come to power in an, in an alliance and, and relying on the, on the strength of the peasants in the, in the countryside, they will obviously first carry out the, the main task of the bourgeois democratic revolution. Above all, the agrarian uh, revolution, the distribution of the land, the breaking up of the big land-owning uh, states. But, but they will not be satisfied with that. They will not be able to remain within those uh, limits of bourgeois democratic tasks. And they will be forced uh, very soon, uh, without any, uh, without any, in, in a continuity, they will be forced to make inroads into bourgeois property uh, relations. That's what, that's what he, he argued. And therefore, the revolution, which started as a bourgeois democratic revolution, would uh, in a permanent way, become a socialist uh, revolution, or will start to carry out some of the tasks of the bourgeois, of the socialist uh, revolution. And in this sense, the revolution will be permanent. But he also said that the revolution will be permanent in another way. Uh, he said that uh, because of the existence of the capitalist system as a worldwide system which links all the countries to these uh, international uh, relations, the revolution cannot be limited to one country, and therefore it will spread, it will necessarily have to spread to other countries in order to be completed. Other countries of much uh, higher level of development of the productive forces, a much higher level of development of capitalism, where there were stronger, uh, more developed uh, working uh, classes. And in this sense, the revolution will be permanent as well. It will be permanent because it will go from bourgeois democratic tasks 
over to socialist tasks. It will be permanent because it will start on the national level with national demands and in a national context, but it will then spread, have to spread in internationally. Now, uh, this is important to understand this because, for instance, just to give you an example, in uh, Venezuela, where in the last uh, 15 years of Venezuelan revolution, the question of permanent revolution has been discussed a lot. Some people have distorted the idea of permanent revolution so, so that for them, uh, from a reformist point of view, it means that we are always in revolution and that the revolution will never reach a turning point, uh, a qualitative uh, turning point in which we'll abolish capitalism. But it will be a permanent revolution little by little. I, they transform the revolutionary idea of permanent revolution into a completely uh, reformist, gradualist uh, interpretation of, uh, of, of, this, of these words, which is obviously not uh, correct. Now, uh, Trotsky was wrong <coughs> on many things in 1905 and in the debates inside the Social Democratic uh, Party, which he ad ad admi admitted himself later on. But on this question, he was the more far-sighted uh, of the theoreticians of Russian uh, social democracy. He was able to foresee in advance uh, the, the, the necessary strategy, but also the, the balance of forces, uh, how, the, how the, the revolution had to uh, necessarily develop. This debate uh, was closed in 1917 by practice. And we also have to understand that we as Marxists, uh, we do not base ourselves just on ideas. Ideas have to be tested against the proof of reality. And if they do not correspond with reality, then there's something wrong with the ideas, not with reality. Uh, and in 1917, it was uh, demonstrated in practice, and Lenin came over to the point of view of Trotsky in relation to this uh, question. Particularly, uh, you can see this in uh, the writings of Lenin just before he arrived in uh, Russia in uh, 1917, and particularly most clearly formulated in the April uh, thesis, 1917, but also in the letters from afar, he was writing letters on, on, on tactics and so on, he was already striving towards this uh, uh, idea. One, very clearly, the bourgeois liberals had to be, had not, couldn't be trusted, but also that uh, in reality it was, it was to be the working class that was to lead the, 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 the revolution in uh, Russia in an alliance with the poor peasants, but also that this could not be limited to purely bourgeois democratic tasks, but also had to make inroads into capitalist uh, uh, property. And the old formula of a democratic dictatorship of the workers and peasants, of the proletariat and the peasantry, was abandoned at this time by Lenin. He was very emphatic. Anyone who now, after the February Revolution, still defends the old formula is living in the past. He was criticizing heavily uh, the right wing of the party, represented amongst others by Kamenev, Zinoviev and Stalin, who had led the party uh, from February until uh, Lenin arrived uh, back in Russia, and had put forward uh, a strategy that was not only the old strategy, but it was a very uh, reformist, uh, moderate interpretation of that old uh, strategy, in which they said, basically, that we must uh, support <coughs> must support the provisional government, we must support the leadership of the Soviets, the leadership of the Soviets was then in support of the provisional government. Basically, they uh, position the Bolshevik party as the far left of the, of the provisional government, as a left critic of the provisional government, not with the intention of replacing it, not with the intention of establishing a dictatorship of the workers in an alliance with the peasants, but rather uh, to, to, uh, to support this provisional government in carrying out the bourgeois democratic revolution, something which the provisional government was completely unable, incapable and unwilling to, to do, as was proven in practice. Uh, the provisional government didn't solve the question of the nationalities, didn't solve the question of the land, and didn't, did certainly not solve the question of the, of the war. It was incapable, unwilling, uh, and did not uh, and did not solve any of these uh, questions. Uh, <coughs> in fact, <coughs> if you see the whole period uh, 
of the Russian uh, Revolution in 1917, you see how the Peasant Party, the social, uh, the SRs, the social revolutionaries, split down the, the middle uh, after the, uh, uh, in, in uh, October in two clearly differentiated wings, the right wing SRs, they went over, right over to the side of counter-revolution, to armed counter-revolution, i.e. they ended up in the same camp as the old regime, as the Tsarist uh, uh, regime, and the left social uh, revolutionaries, who for a period of time were in an alliance with the Bolsheviks, they were part of the first coalition uh, government, and they supported the Bolsheviks, in as much as the Bolsheviks were the ones that were carrying out the agrarian reform, the program of the Social Revolutionary Party for the division of the, the land and, and the distribution of the, of the land. What happened with the left SRs later on is a different uh, matter, but what Trotsky had said, i.e. that the peasantry could not play an independent role and would gravitate towards one or other of the classes in dispute in the cities was also proven to be uh, correct. And this was permanent revolution, by, by any other name, the strategy of permanent revolution was uh, proven in practice, not only proven in practice, was part of the program of the Bolshevik uh, party uh, after the taking of uh, power all the way into the 1920s. And there was no debate about this, the debate had been settled in, uh, in uh, practice. In 1920, for instance, if you read the, <coughs> the thesis of the Second uh, Congress of the Communist International about the national and colonial questions, uh, it is clearly explained uh, there uh, about the need for the workers to play an independent role, uh, about the question that there, there are no, uh, the, the, the countries should not be divided in countries that are right for socialist revolution, countries that are not right for socialist revolution, it says the era, the, the, this, we, we live in the era of Soviet power, and all countries can go over to Soviet uh, power, regardless of the level of, uh, of uh, economic development, <coughs> by virtue of the existence of already Soviet power in the, in the Soviet uh, Union. <coughs> but in 1920, but in 1924, uh, Stalin and uh, Bukharin created this debate, which had not existed uh, since 1917, uh, about the question of socialism in one country. They, they proposed the idea that because of, they said, special circumstances of Russia, being a very big uh, country with uh, lots of natural resources and over a, a big extension of land and so on, that it was possible to build socialism in one country. In reality, this was not so much uh, a theory that came from analyzing concrete circumstances, but was a reaction of the bureaucracy that was already establishing itself as an independent force in Russia, a uh, conservative reaction. They were, there was a certain element of tiredness, all these years of strife and struggle, uh, the civil war in uh, Russia, the defeats of the revolution in different uh, European countries, in uh, the defeat in, uh, in uh, Germany, in uh, Hungary, in Italy, and it seemed that the perspective of uh, world revolution was moving further away into the horizon, and uh, <coughs> the, the, the Soviet bureaucracy wanted to establish their own power and privilege in, in, in Russia, and forget about all this struggle internationally. And then they formulated the theory to back this uh, up, the theory of uh, socialism in one uh, country. And with socialism in one country also came, <coughs> <coughs> sorry, also came the revival of the two-stage uh, theory as a strategy for other uh, countries, i.e. that in other countries, the, of, of backward, uh, backward countries, countries of late capitalist uh, development, somehow the, the working class had to support the revolutionary role of the national bourgeoisie in those uh, countries. The first place, <coughs> the first place where, this was, was this, where this was put into practice, and it was a complete disaster, a tragedy, uh, and a massacre, was in China in, 1925, in, in the 1925-1927 uh, revolution. The, the Communist International, the Communist Party, under the leadership and guidance of uh, Stalin and uh, others, Radek and uh, others, they, they uh, pushed the young Communist Party in China to pursue a policy uh, 
which is completely at odds with the experience of the Russian uh, Revolution. Uh, in fact, it was a policy whereby, which contradicted the congresses and documents of the Communist uh, International. They forced the Communist Party to enter and join the Kuomintang uh, and, 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 and to lose any independence. They basically had to give up the paper. They had to basically dissolve themselves into the Kuomintang because the Kuomintang somehow, which was bourgeois nationalist uh, party, was to carry out the Chinese <coughs> the Chinese uh, revolution. <coughs> In fact, this went so far as to the point where Chiang Kai-shek, the leader of the communist uh, of the Kuomintang, was invited to the executive committee of the Communist uh, International to participate in the in the debates, and the Kuomintang was uh, an observer to the Communist uh, International, completely <coughs> the opposite of what the thesis and resolutions on the national colonial question said in 1920, in the 1920 <coughs> sorry, Congress of the Communist uh, International. First. First, they supported <coughs> the Kuomintang uh, leadership, and the Kuomintang leadership uh, swiftly proceeded to smash the Communist uh, uh, Party. They uh, destroyed the Communist uh, cadres, they killed the trade union uh, organizers, and they basically uh, attacked the Communist Party in a very sharp uh, way. Then later on, in order to cover up for this disastrous uh, strategy and policy, then they decided, uh, the Stalinist uh, leadership of the Communist International, they decided that they had to support the left Kuomintang, which had split around that uh, time. But the left Kuomintang basically proceeded in the same uh, way to attack the, the Communists. Now, the experience of the 1925-27 Communist uh, 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 Chinese uh, Revolution is extremely important because almost to the detail, these uh, events were then replicated in the 1950s, in the 1960s, in many colonial and former <coughs> colonial countries, <coughs> where the communist parties applied exactly the same uh, policies with exactly the same disastrous uh, uh, results. <coughs> Not only this, but the communist uh, international leadership, the Stalin, the Stalin leadership of the communist international, did not draw any lessons, <coughs> any conclusions, from this uh, scandalous uh, disaster, debacle, and, and uh, massacre. In fact, they adopted completely wholesale the old Menshevik uh, policy of two stages, i.e. that first you had to have a bourgeois democratic revolution in which the bourgeois liberals or the progressive sections of the bourgeois were to play the main role, and the role of the communists was to support uh, them uncritically, dissolve within that uh, movement, and then only later on after a certain period of capitalist development, will then the question of socialist revolution be posed and the Communist Party could play a, a role. As I said, this, this was to uh, have completely uh, disastrous effects, particularly after the Second World War, when uh, we saw a massive uh, uprising of the colonial uh, peoples against uh, the domination of the imperialist uh, powers in Africa, in Asia, in Latin America. And in many of these countries, where the communist parties were in existence and they had uh, large uh, uh, support, they followed exactly this policy to disastrous consequences. Uh, in Indonesia, for instance, the communist party was very strong. It was, was a party that organized more than a million uh, members and had perhaps 10 million in uh, party-linked organizations of peasants, workers, and uh, intellectuals, and so on. And, and they basically had a policy of uh, uncritical support for, uh, for Sukarno, who was a bourgeois, uh, 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 allegedly an anti-imperialist uh, bourgeois uh, uh, progressive, and they supported him uh, to the point when there was a military coup and the Communist Party was uh, smashed with the death of uh, a million or more uh, people. Uh, in, in the 1960s. Similar situation happened in countries like Iraq and Sudan in the 1950s and 60s, where the Communist Party was a large force uh, that was able to mobilize hundreds of thousands or even millions of uh, people, but also followed a completely wrong strategy of support for bourgeois liberals, for, for progressive army officers and so on, who as soon as they came to power, 
turned around and destroyed the Communist uh, Party because they feared that the working class uh, masses would go uh, further than what they uh, intended. In Latin America, this was also the, the case for many years, uh, even though <coughs> in Latin America, the original leaders of the communist parties, as it could not be in any other way, had a completely different policy. They had a policy of permanent uh, revolution. For instance, the founder of the communist party in, Cu in Cuba, Julio Antonio Mella in the 1920s, he basically said uh, in the struggle between the foreign thief, the imperialists, and the national thief, the national bourgeois, the, the local thief attempts to uh, gather the support of the local uh, working class. But as soon as the working class starts to move, the local thief realizes that this is a danger for him and enters into an alliance with a foreign thief against the local uh, workers. This is a permanent revolution position, which was at that time not uh, unusual because that was the policy of the Communist uh, International. Uh, the leader of the Communist, leader and founder of the Communist Party in, uh, in Peru, uh, Jose Carlos Mariategui, also had uh, developed a posi similar position and clashed with the Stalinists because of him having that uh, position of permanent revolution in, uh, in uh, Peru and for, for the whole of Latin uh, America. But then in the 1940s, this policy in, in Latin America adopted a particularly cruel twist because the position of the Communist International at that time was one of the struggle between fascism and democracy in the context of the Second uh, World War. And in Latin America, the struggle between fascism and democracy meant support for US imperialism, because US imperialism was on the side of, the, of, the, of democracy in the Second World War against uh, fascism. So you had the Communist parties, like the Communist Party in uh, Bolivia, the Communist Party in Argentina, the Communist Party in Cuba, uh, entering into alliances or supporting from outside elements, political parties in their own uh, countries, which were basically puppets of US uh, imperialism, just because US imperialism was on the side of democracy. In Cuba, for instance, the, the Cuban Communist Party entered the first government of Batista uh, in 1940, 1942, I think it was, with two ministers. The Communist Party was legal and was allowed to dominate the, the trade unions in exchange for their support for the Batista uh, regime in 1940, 1942. This was completely uh, criminal policy that had nothing to do with communism or with uh, Leninism. Uh, and, and in fact was the St Stalinists adopting the old two-stage theory of the, of the Mensheviks. I'd like to, to finish with a couple of uh, examples which I think uh, demonstrate the theory of permanent uh, revolution and, and its uh, validity. Uh, one is a negative example. If you look at the history of the Cuban uh, revolution in 1959, you will see that the leadership of the Cuban uh, Revolution, Fidel Castro, Raul, and, uh, and Che Guevara, they did not have a strategy of a dictatorship of the proletariat or, or the workers coming to power in order to solve the national democratic uh, revolution in, uh, in Cuba. On the contrary, they were bourgeois democrats. They were mostly coming from, the, from petty bourgeois layers of uh, society, and they wanted to solve, they did want to solve the national democratic tasks of the revolution in uh, Cuba, i.e., uh, national independence from US uh, imperialist uh, domination, agrarian uh, reform, which was quite an important issue in, uh, in Cuba, and generally a democratic republic. Uh, because there had been very little democracy in, in the 40 or 50 years of independence in, uh, in uh, Cuba, and the country had been completely under the boot of U.S. Uh, imperialism. And they came to power with this uh, idea. They never intended to uh, violate private property rights or to expropriate the means of production. You can see it in all of the statements in uh, The History Will Absolve Me, which is the program that Castro presented when he was tried for the Moncada Barracks assault, assault in 1953. In uh, any of the state public statements, the program of the 26th of July movement, you will not see any, any of those measures that you can describe as socialist or anti-capitalist. Nevertheless, when they came to power uh, in 1959, 
uh, they were they, they wanted to genu genuinely wanted to solve these problems and they found themselves in a very short space of time of two or three years were advancing in that direction of the national democratic revolution they were forced to expropriate capitalism and capitalism had been abolished in Cuba by, by 1962 1963 uh, they first started in a conflict with the United States they expropriated all United States companies. First, they didn't expropriate them, but they intervened them. Uh, and then later on, they expropriated uh, US companies, US uh, sugar mills, US uh, telephone company, the US telecoms company, the US uh, refining companies, and so on. And finally, they found themselves having expropriated capitalism without uh, that having been the original uh, aim. So in, in, a, in a negative way, this demonstrates that uh, the National Democratic Revolution can only be uh, completed by the expropriation of uh, capitalism in a backward uh, country. There are, there are other problems of the Cuban Revolution, which we can discuss some other time, but this, this is an important uh, question. I also like to mention, in this respect, Venezuela. Uh, in Venezuela, there's been a revolutionary process that was open for many years now. It was open in uh, 1998. <coughs> and again, at the beginning, when Chavez came to power, was elected in 98, uh, this was not just the election of a democratic or progressive uh, president. It was a revolutionary movement in the sense that the masses participated. They took the initiative. They started organizing at the local level and so on. But in any case, the program of Chavez was a program of progressive reforms. In fact, during the 98 uh, election campaign, he came to Britain. He spoke at the Oxford uh, Union, I think. And he praised uh, Tony Blair. He said, I'm for a third way, something that is not communism and is not capitalism. Obviously, that's not what Tony Blair understood for the third way. But in, his confused, uh, in a confused way, Chavez was, had those ideas, right? of cleaning the po politics in, uh, in uh, Venezuela from corruption and, uh, and nepotism <coughs> and so on, of uh, introducing progressive reforms, particularly agrarian reform and, and so on. When in 2001 <coughs> he, uh, he introduced the 49 enabling uh, laws, uh, they were, they were, these laws were not anti-capitalist by any stretch of imagination, but one of them was very crucial was the law on agrarian reform. Now, this agrarian reform uh, on paper was more moderate than uh, the agrarian reform that had already been introduced in uh, Venezuela in the 1960s by a different uh, government of, of Acción Democrática. But nevertheless, the point is that this moderate, very limited, progressive, democratic, national reforms and his attempt to uh, uh, throw away the yoke of US uh, imperialism created an immediate response on the part of the capitalist class and the capitalist class from December 2001 that these laws were passed started to organize uh, an armed uprising to overthrow this uh, government and this kind of proves <coughs> the fact that the ruling class cannot, cannot can, in these countries cannot carry out the bourgeois democratic revolution, but is, but is mortally opposed to the bourgeois democratic uh, revolution. And then over a period of time, can't go into all the details of the Venezuelan revolution, but over a period of time, Chavez, in, in 2005, he made a speech, and he said, through my own experience, through reading and discussing with many people, I have come to one conclusion, that uh, the improvement of the conditions of the poor masses in uh, Venezuela can only be done by uh, going beyond capitalism, and we must go towards socialism. Now, how clear he was about what this uh, meant is a different uh, matter, and uh, he was clearly, he clearly didn't know what followed on from, from that, and what measures had to be introduced. But he was very clear on this, capitalism is no solution for the masses in Venezuela. Even these moderate reforms that we want to implement, can only be implemented by doing away with uh, capitalism and introducing socialism. So in a certain sense, through his own experience, he had come to that uh, conclusion, which proves at the end of the day that the permanent revolution is not just uh, a good idea that Trotsky developed in his head in 1905, but it corresponds or is derived from the concrete analysis of concrete class relations and conditions 
in backward capitalist uh, countries. And this is why this is still relevant uh, today. It's relevant today in uh, Venezuela. It's relevant today <coughs> in Colombia. It's relevant today in many countries. Of course, now it's 100 years since the Russian Revolution. And even these backward capitalist countries today, they are not at the same level of backwardness, or very few countries around the world have now the same level of backwardness that uh, Russia had in 1917. So, so the conditions for socialist revolution are much more favorable in the sense that the working class in many of these countries represents uh, a bigger section of society, is uh, more organized, has a bigger specific weight. In a country like uh, Venezuela, for instance, 85% of the population live in urban areas and uh, the oil workers play a completely dominant role in society. In a country like Bolivia, which has pockets of backwardness, uh, but also there is a very developed uh, mining proletariat, which already in 1952 played a decisive role in the revolution. Countries like uh, Colombia, where the agrarian question is still a crucial question of the revolution, but nevertheless also has a developed working class and a majority of the population who live in urban uh, 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 centers. And so therefore the conditions today are much more favorable, but the strategy remains the same. And whoever in any country of the world thinks that uh, the local bourgeois or the national bourgeois or the progressive, or that there is such a thing as a progressive bourgeois that can play a, a progressive role and that can lead a revolution that genuinely solves or addresses the problems of the problems that are left over from the national democratic revolution, agrarian reform, national independence from, from imperialism and a genuine democratic republic is completely misguided. And all these examples in history show that this strategy leads to complete disaster. And this is the reason why this discussion on the permanent revolution is not just of historic <coughs> interest, but is a relevant discussion for strategy for the revolution in uh, backward countries today.